Welcome everybody. I'm very excited to be unveiling our initial findings from the 2021 Surf Sea Impact Survey. Now doing a survey in COVID times is no easy feat. So I'm actually really proud of where we got to. We missed out on Bihar and that's really unfortunate. But of the other locations, we were able to do a pretty decent sized survey. More than 5,000 households and more than 6,000 individuals. The survey was relatively broad, but though with some very specific questions on change practices, on perceptions and on livelihood constraints and challenges across six different modules. Let's not underestimate the achievement of running this survey in COVID and we really have so many people to thank. We ended up training more than 100 enumerators to try and do this survey in a safe way. And in particular, I want to, to thank the staff at UBKV, RDRS, Satmar and Bari, who really went the extra mile on this. And speaking of extra mile, I think all of the, the CIMIT team really should be thanked because there were so many weekends and late nights that were spent on this. But I think, as you'll see, it's been a really important data set. And of course, I'd like to say that everybody that's assisted in that process, we're going to do our best to acknowledge fully in the forthcoming publications. So what did we find? How much have we achieved? Now let's remember that these survey results to come are not for project sites. These are regionally representative. So we would expect our numbers to be somewhat lower. Now, in terms of change, you can see in the green, we haven't changed the face of the EGP just yet, though we do have some growing momentum in use. But I think the important thing to pick up here is the blue area of awareness. Now, obviously, awareness is a prerequisite for use, and this has been a relatively steep slope that is occurring both for the zero tillage, strip tillage equipment and for the mechanical device transplanter. So that's to say we're setting the prerequisites here for transformational change. Of course, we can see regional differences. So this is for zero tillage and strip tillage. We can see that in Kuchbirha, we have uh, much higher rates of awareness and usage. In uh, Sunsari and Malda, somewhere in the middle, and in Bangladesh, much lower rates of awareness and usage. A somewhat similar story for the mechanical rice transplanter, where we can see in India, um, we have moderate levels of usage, but relatively high levels of awareness. And in Nepal and Bangladesh, growing awareness, but not very much use. So of course, uh, for anybody who knows me, we can't stop there. Binary is just not going to give us enough understanding. So we've taken some frameworks, we've adapted and published new frameworks that go beyond the binary adoption for increased understanding. So here are the results for zero tillage drill use and strip tillage across 57 surveyed communities. A few things to pick out. The first one is that Kuchbihar does have the highest use of um, zero tillage equipment. The second thing which we haven't had time to fully unpack yet is what happens in, com in comparison from surf sea sites to non surf sea sites. So we can see um, quite different patterns of use occurring inside and outside of the project to start to unpack a little bit more. So here I've pulled out five locations of highest zero tillage use. And I pull these out to show why this approach is actually useful. They all have relatively high uptake of zero tillage. In Gulumari, we can see that that location actually has the in total highest usage of zero till anywhere. However, we can see in Chandamoni that the highest current use is present there. But what we really want is autonomous use. So we actually drop back to Kuthi in order to see the, the location with the highest autonomous use. So using this framework, we can start to pull out the more nuanced understanding of the status of adoption. Now, I really like this, this new pathways to use analysis that we've developed in SurfC because I think it gives us a really much deeper understanding of the status of adoption. So for instance, 
binary adoption is only 9%. It's relatively low. There's a lot we can still learn. For instance, when we look at the approval ratio, so we're looking at people who are familiar, but who have not used strip till or zero till machinery, what we see is 97% of them are positive about that machinery. So that means we have a relatively large pool of potential adopters if we can work out what's stopping them from progressing to use. Secondly, we can see that for everybody that's used this machinery, 60% have been supported in some way. That's relatively high. It means that support is still really important in the current context of CASI in the region. Particularly though, what's interesting is that graduation hasn't occurred yet. So when we look at that G pathway from those who have ever been supported to constant use, 4%, it's really low. We still have this substantial pool of people that are still testing, are still evaluating, are still being supported. So there is a question mark around what happens to those farmers when this support ends. And here we are for Surfsea's first medal ceremony, the most successful autonomous adoption of zero tillage. Now, importantly, that's autonomous. It doesn't include those that are currently being supported. And in bronze, we have Gugumari Kuchbiha. And in silver, we have Vidyanandapur Malda. And coming in for the gold medal, we have Kuthi Kuchbiha. Well done to everybody who's worked in those communities for achieving what you have. Now, as we move on to the rice transplanter, across the 57 communities, what we notice is there's not a lot of current support experienced in, in any of these communities. So the adoption that we see is actually autonomous adoption. When we look at the pathways to use, what we do see, however, is there has previously been support, actually similar to the rate that we saw in, in the uh, zero tillage. However, what we see is that graduation of 87%. We didn't see graduation in zero tillage. So there's something to unpack there, um, why there has been that graduation. here. And so to our second medal ceremony of SurfSea for autonomous adoption of the mechanical rice transplanter. In bronze, we have Kushida Malda. In silver, meddling again, we have Vidyanandapur, Malda, and in gold position we have Chandamoni, Malda, sweeping the podium. Well done to our team in Malda for their excellent work. Now for surface seeding, which we only explored in Malda, what we see is um, like the other technologies, there's still a lot of unawareness and unfamiliarity, but what we do see is limited support, but a lot of periodic use. When we come to the pathway analysis, we can see a few things. The first one, that blue E pathway, there hasn't been a lot of support for surface seeding in the communities that we looked at. Surprisingly also, there's a lot of stopped use, those red lines there. However, that's often leading to periodic use. This is something that we didn't see in the other CASI practices and needs further exploration. So now we know where we are. One of the key questions we have is why we are here. So this next section tries to unpack, is CASI valid? Is it working for farmers in the EGP? First up, we looked at 15 different livelihood activities that have changed through CASI. What we found is overwhelmingly, farmers are benefiting, not hugely, but they are benefiting. Roughly 10% of the survey respondents across each of those 15 showed that they were actually disadvantaged, which is not huge. The exception there is drudgery. In the main, it is working for people. Perhaps more importantly is the collective benefit that comes across these 15 different factors. Now, what we can see is in the majority of cases, farmers are getting 12, 13, 14, or even 15 out of 15 benefits uh, from CASI. This is, however, noticeably lower in Sunsari and in Rangpur. 
Of course, that doesn't tell the story of why people choose not to use Cassie. So what we did was compare the current livelihood constraints of those who have never used CASI machinery on the left with CASI users who have experienced benefits on the right. And what we find is that they are correlated, that the challenges that farmers are facing do match with the benefits that CASI is providing. Now, just a few other things to pick out about the benefits of CASI. The first one is that we actually found that CASI enables crop and livestock diversification and intensification, about 80% for both regionally. Um, and really important, I think, that CASI can be an enabler of crop diversification. The second point to pick out is around the argument that CASI is not a yield increasing technology. Now, what we can see from this is that in the majority of cases, it's not yield decreasing, but it can actually be yield increasing, particularly looking at the different locations, such as Coach Birha. Also, some crops tend to go better than others, and some machinery is doing better than others. So there is diversity there, but overall, it is yield positive. But of course, now we've said that adoption is low, but the technology is great. So that leads us to the question, why aren't we seeing larger amounts of adoption. We can look at constraints to uptake in three broad categories. The first one, information. The second one, access to machinery. And the third one, in terms of performance of the technology. What we see from this is that information seems to be a common constraint across the region, and likewise access to machinery. However, performance issues, whilst present, tend to be for specific issues in specific locations. Let's first unpack the information gap that's been identified. And of course, one element of that is awareness. What we can see is there are some regionally specific trends that are occurring over time. However, we do see India with much substantially higher awareness rates than say Nepal and Bangladesh. When we look at the same thing with the mechanical rice transplanter, we notice similar trends, meaning that the information systems are roughly consistent across technologies. Now, awareness is one element, but so is understanding. What you're looking at here is the self-identified level of understanding of CASI. There's not a lot of green there. And what that tells us is that even if you are aware of CASI, you tend not to have a very good understanding of what CASI is. To test this out, we asked those that said they were aware of CASI to tell us if the Rotovator, Laser Land Leveler, and Happy Seeder were CASI technologies. That is, do we understand the principles of zero tillage? What we can see is that across the region generally, there was a pretty poor understanding of CASI machinery and CASI principles. Now, what becomes interesting is when we look at information gaps by typology. Now, we would expect that the unaware, the unfamiliar, and even the non-users would have a limited understanding of CASI. What's interesting, though, is current users and even currently supported users are still identifying information gaps. And that tells us that this, this information gap is causing a constraint to the scaling of CASI across the region. Now, let's unpack the access gap that's been identified. What we can see here is that across a lot of different machinery, there is access issues. And in fact, there is less identification of access issues for zero tillage and strip tillage and mechanical rice transplanters, with the exception of Sansari and for the rice transplanter, Rungful. However, when we asked farmers to identify how many service providers they could find in their local area for the different machinery. What we found is that for the rotivator and for the combine harvester, the numbers were substantially higher than for the other machinery. This was further reinforced when we asked how many of those service providers were actually reliable. This means that there is a vibrant service provision economy for some machinery like the rotivator and the combine harvester, but there isn't yet that for the CASI equipment. This is a really rich data set and there's so much that we can do with it. 
but as always, the Circe ceremony, ceremonial bell is ever present. So let's pick out a few key elements to inform future scaling. And the first one is learning from the effectiveness of previous capacity development initiatives. So what we're looking at here is a comparison of those who have been trained as compared to those who are aware but have not taken training. There's a few things that we can find. The first one is that interest is lower in the trained. That is, it's not just people are interested, but they are progressing to higher typologies of use. One of the interesting findings here, though, is that 15% of the familiar yet untrained population were actually receiving financial support but had never taken training. So there's something to unpack on what's going on there. However, when we look at overall outcome, and particularly what we want is um, constant use, those that are trained are four times as likely to be constant users than those that are not trained. So it suggests that training on the zero-till and strip-till machinery is working. So great, training works, but we want to learn who gave the most effective training. So what we did is we broke down the organisational type of the training organisation to start to look at who was getting the most constant users as a proportion of people trained. What we find is that businesses for the zero tillage drill and strip tillage machinery were getting the best outcomes of constant users per trained individual. However, that might also be a reflection that they gave the most support in that process. When we look at cooperatives, comparatively high, but a much lower conversion from support into constant use. So there's something worth exploring there. And if COVID hadn't got to us, we would have been able to go and understand why these trends were occurring. When we look at the mechanical rice transplant, as we've said, a lot less support. We do find that the most successful training organizations were cooperatives. One of the things that I'm finding quite interesting about this data set and that I'd love to explore more is that we can actually identify the best performing training organizations, both in terms of uh, those that had a high ratio of trained progressing to use and those that are currently unassisted. And we can see that across the two technologies here. Interesting to go a little bit deeper and understand why certain organizations were having better outcomes than others. We haven't had a chance to do that. And because of COVID uh, in the space of surfacy, I don't think we will be able to do that. So a little bit of a missed opportunity there. Now, for me, this is one of the most interesting parts of the survey, and I'm really sad that I don't have time to do it justice. But we started to explore the information systems that, were, that farmers were using for CASI and other machinery. So what we have here on the left-hand side is the current main information source for zero tillage and strip tillage machinery, and on the right, their preferred main source of information. And what we can see is regionally, most people have the same current and preferred source, though other farmers are probably overrepresented as a main source of information. But where it gets interesting is when we look at each region individually. So let's take Sunsari, for instance. The green there is other farmers. Now that's about 30% of the population who have their main source as other farmers. But when we look at the preference, it's much, much lower. In fact, in Sunsari and in the Eastern Nepal Terai, we see that while government extension is a really minor source of information, that's how farmers would want to receive their information. And that has some strong implications for scaling strategies. If we look across at Kuchbihar, you can see that, and in Rampur, you can see that international NGOs are really strongly preferenced uh, and seen as a main source of information, whereas in other locations, it's much smaller. In, in Rashahi, we can see that government extension is really, really dominant. Yet in Kuchbihar, it's much, much lower. So there are these really interesting regional differences that come about when we start to look at this. The same way where in Malda, farmer groups are really preferenced, whereas in other locations like Rampur, Rajahi in Bangladesh, they're not. This is really important to developing scaling strategies. So we're starting to unpack 
who are the best organizations or the most effective organizations? What types of organizations are most effective? Where is information coming from and where is it preferenced to come from? What that then leads us to is, okay, what topics, what information should be a priority to use these new channels that we understand? So when we asked farmers about the topics that they demanded for zero tillage and mechanical rice transplanter training, what we can see is that Sunsari sits itself apart from the others. The four other locations are, are more or less similar, maybe Rashahi a little bit sim uh, different from the other three, but Sunsari definitely wants more introductory material, whereas the other locations have a mix of different topics that they'd like training on. Now, likewise, when asked on who should give the training, again, we see some regional differences that are occurring very much in Bangladesh, two very different scenarios from each other and from the rest of the region. Malda, Kuchbihar, Sunsari, tending to really focus on government extension and farmer groups, whereas Rangpur, tendency to look for NGOs, and in Rashahi, almost exclusively asking for government extension. So again, this is really important to how future scaling should be designed. To round out our learnings from this so far, there's two sustainability elements to explore. Now, the first one is who will support the scaling of TASI once the project has ended? The survey identified 82 organizations that have supported TASI across the region. Of these, 63 have supported the zero tillage drill, 67 the mechanical rice transplanter, and 12 have supported surface seeding in Malta. West Bengal definitely has the most organizations of around 50. Only The, the interesting thing here is that only 29% of the identified organizations supporting CASI were actually associated with surf seed. So it does indicate that it's not just surf seed keeping the boat afloat. Only five organizations were identified by farmers that were working across multiple geographies, and none of the organizations identified were working across more than one country. For the zero tillage drill, technical assistance was the primary support mechanism with 38 organizations identified, following by seed inputs, machinery, and training. The other key aspect of sustainability is if farmers believe that the government is supporting them to use CASI practices. Across the region, respondents tended to think that the government did want them to use zero tillage and strip tillage machinery, and to a lesser extent, the rice, mechanical rice transplanter. This was regionally different though, with Bangladesh having the highest and Malda having the lowest. Of those people that thought that, there was across the region a relatively strong perception that the government was providing support to use these machines. Now this is important when we think about sustainability. If farmers think that the government wants them to do it, they are more inclined, and especially if they think support is there, to take Cassie. So just to recap on this data analysis narrative, we've learned where things have worked and where things haven't worked. We've confirmed CASI in farmers' fields through farmers' experiences as having multiple different benefits. We've identified some of these roadblocks that are constraining use and what we can do about them. And we've also identified who's going to be able to support and scale once the project finishes. But I think really importantly, what we haven't been able to do is analyze all of the data that we actually do have, because there's so much more we can learn from this data set. In terms of the data collected that we haven't yet analyzed, we can still explore ownership issues, process and experiences and service provision. We have residue data and how that plays into decision making. We have temporal data on the adoption process for each adopter. Importantly, there's two aspects here, particularly around definitions and nuance around what is CASI in the EGB, particularly around the three elements and components that are traditionally packaged for CASI, as well as intensity of use of those different components and how that packages together. Finally, we also have 
now the different locations and unpacking these differences. In terms of deepening our understanding, all of the statistical significance in our results, we still need to define that out. We also have our various regressions that help us understand relationships between the data points. And finally, we haven't yet extrapolated what all of these results mean at a regional level, particularly between our original scale out and non surfsy nodes. And that can really help us to piece together a more regional impact assessment. However, there are two key things that we need to prioritize in this data set. The first one is that we have a lot of gender disaggregated data, both for the spouse of male headed households and female headed households. And there's huge potential for learnings to come out of this. The second one is that SurfC has put a lot of work into ADOPT and we have the data now to do some really meaningful validations. So what we really need is some dedicated time to finish this off. COVID caused this delay and we really had hoped to have this survey done even two years ago and we just couldn't get there. All of these learnings, we've got the data, we just need some dedicated time to finish it off. Thank you.